All right, boys, welcome back to Shooting It Straight and buckle up for this ride. All right, <laughs> and some of you might want to have your therapist on your speed dial right now for this video. Um, you know, whenever the caliber debate thing comes up, you can bet that the smaller caliber guys are going to start with a tired old well caliber doesn't matter and they'll quickly follow that up with shot placement is all that matters <laughs> you know they all that's that, that comes out of their mouth all the time now these these two expressions alone tell me a lot about these folks all right they uh, in my way of thinking they are somehow trying to justify their choice of a uh, barely adequate caliber by trying to convince themselves and others that all calibers do the same thing which of course is not factual there's nothing wrong with smaller calibers if you like them well that's fine you know that's your option but secondly let's look at this shot placement crap that they always throw up they obviously have zero experience in a lethal force situation all right because you can rarely ever determine where exactly your shot will land on the person that is hell-bent on attacking you and to think that you have the ability to pick out a specific uh, place on that body and to to shoot in that chaotic high-stress gunfight is, is just pure fantasy you know the best any of us can hope for is one maybe two shots somewhere in the torso which is exactly why we train to shoot center mass of our target regardless of caliber right so to that extent then yes shot placement does matter you want to hit the center of mass but as long as you hit somewhere in that center of mass you're doing fine after that shot placement <laughs> is out the window you can forget it in defensive shooting precise shot placement is not the goal since we will not achieve that goal anyway in that situation effective shot placement is all that really matters which is anywhere in the upper torso region a head shot or a disabling pelvic shot all right now the FBI studies uh, determined long ago that caliber does matter all right I suppose I should explain a little bit in late 1987 the FBI created the wound ballistics seminar which was comprised of noted experts in the fields of science human biology and medicine all relevant to the topic of wounds caused to humans by ballistic means now its purpose was to identify the performance criteria of a bullet that would be most likely to inflict an incapacitating wound on a human target in other words what exactly would a bullet need to be able to do in order to quickly stop or otherwise incapacitate a person okay that's what they were looking for this research seminar was in direct response to the infamous 1986 Miami shootout with the FBI in which seven agents were seriously wounded uh, two of them died you know at the hands of two violent murdering fugitives now these fugitives managed to continue this murderous assault despite being shot numerous times by the agents throughout the firefight and it was an extended firefight now the FBI blamed this on the weak 9mm since one of the 9mm bullets uh, fell short of reaching the suspect's heart after the bullet had already went through his upper arm and went into the side of his upper torso but stopped a couple of inches short of his heart all right but it's my opinion that other factors involved were more to blame such as 
poor marksmanship and uh, you know lack of just lack of preparation okay the FBI knew they were going up against murderers armed with rifles yet the agents failed to bring a single rifle with them now I am of the opinion that the nine millimeter bullet in question here did what it was supposed to do it was a fatal wound it was just not an immediate fatal wound which is not at all unusual but anyway now throughout this research seminar tests of various calibers which were suggested by the seminar panel were conducted and recorded the whole thing was carefully documented meticulously uh, as was the agency's current caliber 9 millimeter to act as a comparison now the findings of the seminar was organized into an official FBI report by Special Agent Yuri Patrick of the FBI Firearms Training Unit in Quantico, Virginia and uh, Unit Chief John C. Hall and that was done back in 1989. The, the seminar ended in 1989 and that's when they wrote their official report as to the findings of that seminar. Now allow me to quote from that very report all right, this is not doctored up internet bullshit. This is the real deal. <coughs> FBI letterhead, the whole nine yards. Now I'm going to give you a quote here from these guys. Given adequate penetration, the larger diameter bullet, in other words, the larger caliber, will have an edge in wounding effectiveness. It will damage a blood vessel or vital organ that a smaller projectile may barely miss. Additionally, the larger permanent cavity or the wound channel may also lead to faster blood loss. Now although such an edge clearly exists, its significance cannot be measured. End of that quote. Now regarding the shot placement cries, here's another quote from those guys. Shot placement is an important and often cited consideration regarding the suitability of weapons and ammunition. However, consideration of caliber is also important and should not be ignored. Hmm. So caliber doesn't matter, huh? Well, according to the FBI, it does matter. Alright. Another quote. The critical element of the bullet is penetration. The bullet must pass through to large blood bearing organs and or vessels and be of sufficient diameter so as to promote rapid blood loss. Now given desirable and reliable penetration the only way to increase bullet effectiveness is to increase the severity of the wound and that can only be done by increasing the size of the hole made by the bullet. I'm still in that quote here. Bullets that will not penetrate to vital organs from all possible angles is not acceptable. Of those that will penetrate sufficiently, the advantage is always given to the larger caliber. But caliber doesn't matter, right? Now speaking on hollow point ammo right quick, here's a quote, increased bullet mass or the weight will increase penetration. In most cases, increased velocity will increase penetration, but only until the bullet begins to deform in some way, including expansion. But at that point when it starts to expand, um, velocity decreases penetration permanent cavity or the wound channel will be increased if the hollow point bullet expands as will larger diameter bullets. However, in no case should selection of ammunition be made where bullet expansion is necessary to achieve the desired performance. I can't help but think of all the HST people here. Handgun hollow points, I'm still in that quote by the way, 
Handgun hollow point bullets expand only 60 to 70 percent of the time, at best, due to a number of variables to include deformation to the bullet nose from striking bone or the cavity becomes clogged with clothing and so forth. Insufficient impact velocity from short barrels like those little subcompacts and micros that you guys love to carry around will also prevent expansion because a bullet is not meeting the hollow point expansion threshold. They have to be going a certain velocity before they can expand. Bullet expansion must never be the basis for cartridge selection but should instead be considered a bonus if and when it does occur. Proper ammunition selection should be determined first by adequate penetration ability and then by the unexpanded diameter of the bullet second as this is all the shooter can reasonably rely on. End of quote. All right, now, <clears throat> now around this time is when the um, when the uh, FBI created their now famous ballistic testing protocol using that six by six by eighteen inch uh, blocks of solidified gelatin with a ten percent porcine mixture to simulate soft human tissue as part of their ammunition testing protocol. Now this is based upon the research of the noted Dr. Martin Fackler, director of the Army's Wound Ballistics Laboratory at the Litterman Institute. Now fellas, it's obvious from this report and many others like it still today that there are a few firm facts about incapacitation and how caliber can be related to it. Again, this information is not new, but these days most folks choose not to believe it because it doesn't support popular beliefs. Well folks, you know, people are entitled to their own opinions, but they are not entitled to their own facts. And here's some of those facts in the context of wound ballistics. The most, common, the most common means of rapid incapacitation is rapid blood loss, either from a damaged blood-bearing organ or through the amount of tissue destruction. Now that's a fact. You don't get to discard that. Yes, a direct CNS shot is instant, but it doesn't happen very often. And when it does happen, it's generally luck instead of skill. The rate of blood loss from a blood-bearing organ is much faster than blood lost through mere tissue or muscle damage, which means that bullet penetration is more important than bullet expansion. Tissue is only damaged by actual contact from the projectile itself. In other words, if the bullet doesn't touch it, it is not destroyed. Nothing else destroys tissue from a handgun. Now, we're talking about handguns here. Rifles are totally different. But handguns, the only thing that causes any tissue destruction or damage is contact with the actual bullet. All right. Temporary stretch cavities cause no damage. Again, that's a proven fact. You can't throw it out. The bigger the, the diameter of the bullet, the bigger the wound channel. Um, and wound channel is destroyed tissue, okay? Now that's also a fact. You can't just toss that shit away. Um, the more tissue destroyed, the more blood is lost. Makes sense yet? The more or rapid the blood loss, the quicker the incapacitation. Blood loss equals lost blood pressure. Lost blood pressure equals unconsciousness. Unconsciousness equals incapacitation right now let me let me give you an example of potential tissue destruction levels caused by different calibers again this is a test conducted by the FBI not me they set up three blocks of those ballistic gels gel blocks one block for each of the three calibers that they decided to test all right into one block 
they fired a Winchester 147 grain jacketed hollow point 9mm. And to block number two, they fired a 180 grain jacketed hollow point 10mm that was reduced to obtain 950 uh, feet per second velocity, which was the emerging new 40 Smith & Wesson. And into the third block, they fired a Remington 185 grain jacketed hollow point. The measured amount of tissue destruction for each of those three calibers is as follows. The 45 ACP destroyed 4.22 cubic inches. All right. The downloaded 10 millimeter or emerging 40 caliber destroyed 4.11 cubic inches. The 147 grain 9 millimeter destroyed 2.82 cubic inches. And this was repeatable thus it was a valid test. You can't argue with science. This completely disproves the common argument all calibers are the same. Now does this mean that the the 45 ACP uh, is the best round for self-defense? No it doesn't. You know personally uh, personally I've, I've got just as much confidence in my 40 Smith & Wesson than I do my 45 ACP simply because it has the ability to penetrate deeper and has more energy transfer. Now does this uh, does this mean that the 9 milli is inadequate for, for self-defense? Well no. What this research simply proves today is that all calibers are not the same and generally, but not in every case, but generally, the larger calibers will incapacitate an attacker a bit quicker than smaller ones, in part due to its larger diameter alone, all else being equal, that is. All right? Uh, now, this ties into levels of stopping power. Now, exactly how much quicker a person will be incapacitated uh, cannot be precisely measured, all right? The fact, the fact remains that all popular calibers here have the ability to incapacitate, but at a different rate, assuming the shot placement of each caliber is identical, absent a C and S shot. Now, fellas, I've heard the argument before, and I know what you're saying, but, but the study is over 30 years old. Bullet technology, bullet technology, Bullet technology has not changed anything relating to this study because all calibers have benefited from bullet technology. When talking about the bullet's tissue destruction capabilities, the amount that is de the amount of that is dependent upon bullet diameter, whether it's expanded or not, and nothing else. All right, and last I heard, all calibers are still the same diameter. You know, a, 40, a, a 45 is still 11 and a half millimeters. A 40 caliber is still 10 millimeters. A 9 millimeter is still 9 millimeters. You get what I'm saying here? Now, I mean, am I missing something? So, from this study and report, it appears that the FBI concurs with the bigger is better argument, at least to some degree which is also supported by countless shootouts by modern legendary lawmen and the Moro Rebellion War back in the Philippines, back in the early 1900s. Now, will caliber always make a difference in incapacitation? No, not, not always. Nothing is ever 100%. Nothing is ever absolute. And that certainly is not. But there is a good chance that caliber can make a difference. And I don't know about you, but I prefer to take full advantage of any possible benefit available when it comes to defending my life or the life of my loved ones, right? I don't leave anything to chance. Okay. Well, anyway, fellas, uh, you know, thanks for watching. Hey, I'm Antonius, and I'm just, I'm just shooting it straight. Ciao, boys.